Thank you. Okay, I'm quickly going to, I just wanted to introduce some of the research that we've done in the past. Um, I'm going to talk first about the, just give you a brief overview of the pre-COVID vulnerabilities of the waste reclaimers. Um, then I'm going to ask Eva to explain to us what happened to them during COVID. Eva um, is here as well. She's one of the waste reclaimers in and part of the African Reclaimers Organization. And then lastly, I will ask Belinda, because she's from Petco, um, about the responses from government and industry. And I will explain to you how the waste system is working. So I think I just wanted to, to start with um, just looking at the ILO's definition of what is decent work. And I, the ILO doesn't talk about decent work as the type of job that you're doing, but it's about the working conditions and the aspects that are linked to work. And I, I, the, a comment I wanted to make about, I think in South Africa, we don't, we're not geared, although we have a big informal sector, somewhere along the line, I think in South Africa, we're not thinking uh, towards the informal sector and the informal workers and to create decent conditions for informal workers. And this is the definition from them. And I think there are certain things that is important for any job uh, if it's formal or informal, is fair income, security, social protection, integration, organization, participation. These are the concepts. And I think it's very important to note, take note of these concepts when we talk about the informal workers. So what is currently the situation around and who are the waste reclaimers? I think it's important to note that they are it's, it's, an, it's an international phenomenon, and in particular, the developing countries. There are currently 15 million waste pickers around the world. They are self-employed, they're informal, and they are entrepreneurs. We really view them as entrepreneurs because they work for themselves. Different, I think, from uh, other informal workers who are working maybe for, for, for a farmer. The, in, the informal pickers, are pick, they, they go out, they pick the waste either on the streets or on the landfills and they go and sell it. So they an entrepreneur. They collect recyclable materials, plastics, paper, cardboard, scrap metal, and they sell it to the buyback center. But what we have found in our research is that they also collect more than recyclables. They, they recycle, they fix uh, things from for themselves that they can use or they are further entrepreneurs. Some of them will collect bricks and clean it and sell it. They will, co will uh, collect wood um, and make something out of it and then sell it. So in some ways, they see that there are more things taken from the, that doesn't go to the landfill sites. They are currently, it's estimated that waste because are the people that collect 50% of the world's plastics. So they're extremely important. If we come to South Africa, this is the estimation of the amount of waste pickers that we have in South Africa. But I think the important recognition is that they are responsible for 90% of what is recycled in South Africa. Although we don't have a, a, a big recycling culture in South Africa, most of the recyclables are, are collected by the waste pickers they take it to the buyback center and they sell it. So if they were not there, it would be, it would go to the landfill site. What is important about this is as well is this is different from any from from developed countries. In no developed country you will find um, waste because they they it's sort of an emerging issue, but in the developing countries you will find the waste pickers and they don't get to rec recognition for what they're doing. And it's currently estimated that they save the municipality 700 million rand per year in airspace. And I think it's a very significant number to take into consideration when we think of the circumstances under which the, the, uh, the waste pickers are working. This picture is just to show you in terms of, this is the, the cycle that waste are collected from the houses or maybe we should start at the generation. It's going to the shops. We buy the packaged material. 
the, the, it is normally, it goes into our bins, the, the municipality pick it up and they take it to the landfill site. So currently the position is that the waste pickers are taking it from our, our bins, they take it on their trolleys and they take it to the buyback center, that's the little picture at the bottom. This picture was developed by Dr. Melanie Sanson from WITS and I, we will speak later to this again. So they are actually an integral part of the waste system. And here is, I think, Do uh, uh, Professor Linda Godfrey from um, the Waste RDI Roadmap developed this. And this is also highlighting to us the, the very, very critical role of the waste picker in the value chain and in the service chain. They are the link between the service chain. The service chain is the, min the municipality that are taking your waste to the landfill. And then the waste picker are the main person who takes your waste out of the service chain to the value chain. They sell what they collect to the buyback center and the buyback center then it goes via the buyback center into the value chain. So this is, so these, the waste picker is not separate from a formal system. They move outside the formal system, but they link to a formal system. And we will also refer to that a bit later. Just in terms of some of our research that we have found to come back to women in Women's Month, this is what we have found in different studies that we have done, is that the, in 2012, we did a study on street waste pickers, and we found that 96 were male and 4% were female, and there's a specific reason for that. And then on the landfill sites, we find much more of the equal number, 52%, 48%, and it was interesting, in two separate studies, we found exactly the same number. And two years ago, we did a study in Belleville and we had these other numbers in terms of in the 60s and in the 30s, 36% were women. I think the main reason for that is safety. It's difficult for women to push a trolley. It's difficult for women to be alone on the street. And um, it's easier maybe in some regards to be on a landfill site where you're part of a group of people where you uh, don't have to push a trolley. And I think this is why women probably, and Eva can speak to that, is maybe on the landfills. I think cert in certain cities, things are changing a bit. These are just some pictures on, um, on the waste pickers that we've taken. And I think I want to talk to that because it will explain some of the vulnerabilities they have. The first picture at the top was on a landfill site. I think what is very difficult about that, you can see that there's no shade. It was an extremely hot day, it was in the 30s, and there was no shade for the people to sit under, although they are busy taking the waste from the landfill sites. So the municipalities are not really acknowledging them as valuable in terms of what the service they offer to the municipality. The second picture is, was taken in Belleville, where we could see that the female and the male were working together. And that I often find females will, do st will be on the street if there's also male partners that are doing that with them. There's a female, um, a female picker with, with the card boxes on her head. And there's on the, in the right-hand corner, there was a male who was pushing a major trolley with lots of boxes. And I think that can speak to also maybe that makes it difficult for women. Maybe just to give you this picture of what we have found on some of the landfill sites. Uh, although they work on the landfill sites, there's very seldom support for the pickers on the landfill site. You can see in the first one, this, these were nine landfill sites that we visited and only three of, one, two, three, four, five of them had access, had any form of fresh water for the pickers to use. They had to bring their own water. There were no taps no water that they could use. There was only three of them who had any form of sanitation that the women and, and the men could, could use. And in the last one, there was only one um, landfill site where we could find some form of shade. There was a building where they could at least sort this stuff. But I think what was interesting, the shade was also far away from the actual, where the actual activities were. So they did not really use it. I also want to share you this to understand 
how can I call it brave? Can I call it entrepreneurial women can be? This was taken in, in the Eastern Cape. Professor Swart was actually part of this, of this research. Somebody told us to go on the end too, and there were women who are collecting scrap metal in their villages on the end too, close to Mount Freire and Butterworth and those areas, if you know it. And every month they will take all the scrap that they've collected to the end too, and they will wait for big trucks to come and pick them up. So you can see on the right hand, sort of the, the scrap metal that was lying there. And they will sometimes even stand on this on next to the road for weeks or for a few days. And then they take it to Durban. And here is the group of women that I find in Durban at one of the buyback centers where they arrived. So that's 500 kilometers away. And they will sell the scrap to the buyback center. But it's also on this way that they traveling, that they travel in groups because it's safer. I think the, the crime issue is a major issue when it comes also to, to, the, um, to the pickers and to the reclaimers. Okay, some that we've also, that is very important. If you can see here that we have found that the, the reclaimers are actually in this business for, for because it's their work. It's not something that they just do for one or two days. And we find many of them are actually for, uh, for, for 30 years, they have been in reclaiming already or in picking waste. I've put this in terms of income. I think what uh, Carmen was talking about in terms of income, they, this is this is a range of income that people have been they were on the landfill site and you can see I think this is for a weekly income that we determined this it's a, not everybody sells daily most of the pickers sells daily uh, they collect this stuff they take it to the buyback center and they get an income in some instances on certain landfills we find that they will sell their collections once a week so this question was asked to them what did you earn last week? Why I put that, this one up was to see that in, if you don't have anything to sell, if you didn't collect, you, you have no income. So there's no safety if, there's, if you didn't work for the day. And we often find that people cannot afford to do anything else but to go out and collect on a daily basis because you miss an income. Um, and some of them, it was a small amount, something like 2% may earn up to 2,000 Rand for a week's work, but the average is normally around about 500 Rand a week. Okay, and here there were many risks that the people experience on the landfill sites and on the streets, and in particular the women, but I've highlighted some of these particular issues that the women were raised to us. One of the issues was the dominance of the males over the females. They would particularly say that, that they are not supported by the males or they will take the stuff that they've collected. Uh, they will steal it or the young people will come and steal the women's collections, what they have done, crime, the young boys steal our cell phones. We get robbed and raped or some of the issues that they shared with us. The scholars are dangerous, safety is a problem, crime is too much. This in addition to, I think, healthy issues uh, with they on the in particular on the landfill site where there's smoke and dust, the open in the weather conditions, there's no shade for them. If it rains, they on the landfill site. There's no protective clothing. And then a, a big risk on landfill sites in particular is machines and big trucks that are moving on the landfill sites. So um, the um, I just want to see my heading. <laughs> Somewhere I'm missing my heading at the moment. Um, I will get back to that. Okay, so at this point, I, I wanted to highlight some of the vulnerabilities. Before we have a further discussion, I'm going to ask Eva to share with us, you know, what happened to you during COVID. Eva, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Eva Mukwena, chairperson of ARO, which is African Reclaimers Organization based in Joburg, but mostly expanding at the moment. So it's 
it's really stressful. I don't wanna lie. During the COVID-19, when the lockdown started, it was so, so hateful to see most women crying because they couldn't get money to send to their kids who are from outside South Africa. Even the ones that are here, the South African, they were also struggling. It was, it was a shame. I don't wanna lie. Up until um, industries came on board with those food parcels, and and uh, Aro, Aro, there are people who are working with Aro, like Dr. Melanie Simpson, and the other people that are from outside Aro. They are, they are others are, are residents. They did a back body in order for Aro to help the reclaimers to get food. So it really affected them a lot. Even now, some of them, they haven't picked up. Like, it's really sad to see a woman cry because she, she's eating. She's got a loaf of bread, but her kid doesn't have. In Pretoria, what I've experienced with the woman there, it was so sad. They couldn't even afford to buy a loaf of bread. And some of them, they didn't even get those food parcels that were coming from industries that were distributed by environmental affairs through the industries gave them to environmental affairs. So it, it, it's really like, I don't, when I, I can't even describe the way, the shame that was in most of the women and most of the men were so abusive towards them because they can't go out and get money. Now it's really stressing, especially the reclaimers, because if a man and a woman are reclaimers, I used to get calls during the night. Till they were telling me that they're starving, they're dying of hunger. After you buy a pack of milli meal for her, she's crying, my kids, they don't have anything to eat. So it was really like stressful all throughout. I even had stress. I had to go and see a doctor consultation because my stress levels were so high. I couldn't even think properly because of the situation that I was encountering for each and every day. So that was the situation here in Joburg and in Pretoria for most of the women who are doing way speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. Okay, um, I'm going to ask Belinda. Belinda is at Petco, she can explain. That is um, an organization that's linked to, uh, Belinda, can, Belinda came on board with the, with the industry and with the government and with support from the pickers that Eva was referring to. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, if I can just maybe um, talk about from the industry uh, point of view what um, we did and how we assisted. So um, when COVID hit, we obviously all the recycling plants closed, all the buyback centers closed, and we realized, um, and they were not allowed to collect in any case for the first two months, I think. So as an industry, we then decided that we will collect money um, that we can then at least give food vouchers, and we thought we'll do it in phases right through COVID, right through the lockdown, until people can collect, or even now, after, after they are collecting, we are still doing some initiatives. So the South African packaging sector, which consists of all your packaging, your paper, cans, glass, plastics, Petco, all of them, we raised 785,000 Rand. And with that, we could, could assist 3,925 informal reclaimers with food vouchers to the value of 200 Rand. It was, it's not a lot, but we thought at least it can help so many people to have a basic income or a basic voucher. What I have to say, then we worked through the Department of Environmental Affairs. What they then, Petco, we, because we work with the buyback centers, we have a list through our buyback centers of about 6,000 plus waste pickers. 
And um, we decided, or the packaging industry decided to work through Department of Environmental Affairs because uh, they also appealed to us. And then we supplied the list to the Department of Environmental Affairs. We also believe that they then communicate with all the municipalities to supply lists to them. All these lists were then submitted and the vouchers were starting to pay, be paid to the people. We did pick up some challenges though, because the challenges was that some people apparently get, got the SMSs, but they didn't go and um, cash in on the vouchers because they were suspicious. They, weren't, they thought it might be a scam. Um, and then also a problem was that um, it was it was with a few retailers like uh, Save Ride, Boxer, Pick and Pay, Checkers, etc. But for instance, if a person in uh, Hogs Bag, you know, then Rural Transkai got a voucher, it means they have to travel 300 k's to Umtata to go and spend the voucher, which it's not. I mean, the transport will cost them more to actually spend the voucher. So vouchers. Electronic vouchers does not work in all the areas. We also then uh, bought some vouchers through pick and pay. And we um, then actually physically distributed uh, to 200 waste pickers in the Susselberg area with working with SAUPA, the South African Waste Pickers Association. Um, then what that, so that's what we've done with that 785,000 rand. But then, uh, the service provider came back to us and vouchers to the value of 500,000 Rand was not cashed in. So we then, either because the phone numbers were wrong or either because the people were suspicious or they couldn't go and cash in the vouchers, maybe it was too far. So we then had to supply new lists so new people were paid uh, those vouchers. What we've done then as well, um, besides uh, our Petco recyclers, we've got Daran Far. Senlida and um, Extrapet, our PT uh, recyclers, they contributed cash of 550,000 Rand in round one. And besides that, they've also donate, donated together 7,000 masks and 50 liters of sanitizers, which we then distributed uh, to the waste pickers. Um, we are currently working with Extrapet. Extrapet and Petco are going to support 400 waste pickers with blankets. Um, that's made from recycled PT, and then also another 76,000 rand worth of uh, food vouchers that will that was collected by the three recyclers. Um, what we've done as well, just before the lockdown, we supported Arrow uh, for their separation of source project and safe collections with 400 bins and 50,000 recycling plastic bags that they can then use uh, to collect um, recyclables from the households. Unfortunately, then. The project was stopped because they couldn't obviously collect, but they're now busy um, collecting again from the households. And you know, uh, like Rini was saying, the small buyback centers, SMMEs and the waste, because they really struggled because of the lockdown, because they couldn't sell anything, they couldn't pick up. Um, also our recyclers were closed. Our recyclers before they closed had quite a lot of stock on their, in their plants. And then when they eventually opened, the buying was very, very slow because they then first had to process all the stock that they bought just before the lockdown. So even though they were open for a month, it still took a long time until the buying actually really kicked off. Uh, currently it is, it's, it's, it's almost back to normal now. But what Petco has done during the lockdown as well, we also look at supporting our small buyback centers and SMMEs. And we have then, you know, just to help them in their little businesses because they're not earning an income. Some of them don't have scales, et cetera. So we've supported 39 of them with collection equipment, like your scales with uh, trailers, trolleys, et cetera. 39 projects nationally that we've supported now during lockdown. Our one shareholder, um, Safripol, uh, donated between Petco and Safripol, we bought 4,500 face shields and 1,500 bulk bags, which are have been and are currently being uh, dis disbursed to small SMMEs and their waste pickers nationally. It took a little bit long to disperse this because our transporter had to get a permit to travel across borders and it took longer than what he thought it would take him. Um, and then I'm also on the committee for the Institute of Waste Management and they 
have committed to donate 10,000 Rand for 50 for food vouchers for 50 waste pickers that we're going to um, assist on the Paris landfill site. Um, I am busy talking to Coca-Cola and um, I'm just waiting for the final commitment, but we are going to assist Arrow, uh, further Petco with um, Coca-Cola. And then I'm also working with Coca-Cola and they're going to, uh, they're busy looking at perhaps supporting some of the buyback centers that's really struggling with a small stipend, you know, that just get their business back going again, give them a bit of a cash flow so they can actually start buying the material. Because that's also a problem. When they opened, they had no cash flow because they, and then they couldn't buy the material. So even when the waste pickers came to them, the buyback centers had no cash flow to buy. So we're looking at um, supporting them also then with some um, cash flow. And basically, that's what we're busy with. We're continuously busy um, seeing how else can we support them. Uh, we do believe that um, we're working with municipalities nationally as well, uh, that they should uh, now start incorporating the waste picker guidelines into the municipalities, register the waste pickers in their municipalities. So in a crisis like this, we can actually contact them and we can assist them. The fact that the municipalities don't always know who is working in their uh, municipality means that those people cannot be assisted. And we really wanna change that. And we're also speaking to municipalities to, to register them and then to incorporate them into their uh, formal wa um, waste management and recycling programs. And what we say to small municipalities and others that if the municipality, we believe the municipality should make land available for the waste pickers to store and sort the material. And as an industry, we will come in and these hubs, we can then come and support with bailing machines, scales with equipment. So then the waste pickers can sell directly to the recyclers. And obviously when you sell in bulk, the price that you get for your recyclables are more than when you're selling as an individual waste picker. So that's it from Petco and industry. Thank you, Belinda. Can I just wanted to add to what Belinda is saying. I think the big thing that we've realized um, during this period is that uh, Arrow started a few years ago. So there's, there's an organization who can speak on behalf of the, of the reclaimers. But I think we've realized that it's not, they're not organized enough throughout the country. So because we need to get the, the reclaimers registered, we need to get them organized. And I think that counts for most of the informal workers. Because when we started to look for telephone numbers, some of them are registered and some of them are somewhere registered with Petco or with a different organization, but there's not a national register. Yeah. And we don't have an idea, as I showed earlier, there's no specific idea how many people there are. So currently we are busy with that um, to see if we can start with the registration process now. And if I could just come in here, Rini, as well, that I, uh, that I didn't mention, uh, Petco has just purchased uh, an ID card machine for Arrow. Um, they, they, we actually paid for it already at the end of last month. So the service provider will contact them any day now. I'm actually going to follow up tomorrow where they will then deliver the uh, identity card so they will print their card with a with a photo and then as arrow wants to give them a number or whatever and we also provide it so we're providing them with a printing machine plus um, a thousand blank cards for them to start and then they can immediately register and identify a thousand of them so, thank you very much but i think that i think exactly that the critical part of being organized so that in future if there's a crisis like this that, that, that workers are organized to be able to be contacted, to be supported if that yeah. is the situation. Yeah. Um, there is a, Belinda, there is a question for you from uh, Professor May. Okay. Um, uh, is it, did national, provincial, or any local government assist in any way with the different initiatives that you have mentioned? They, they, they didn't um, support financially. They basically coordinated. Um, I think they're a bit cash strapped. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Rini, Eva, and Belinda for your um, input. And thank you, Carmen, again. Um, we have some questions. Um, let me put the first question to you, Carmen. Um, and it's from uh, Prof. May. 
One of the motivations for the alcohol ban was to reduce gender-based violence. Do you think this worked? Um, also, can you expand on the point about increased uh, dependency on male income earners? What are the implications of that statement? Carmen? Um, are you unmuted? I think you can you can speak, Carmen. Uh, I'm saying that alcohol is just one of the factors contributing to GBV. It's not the only factor. Um, so when there is alcohol um, dependence or use, there is uh, definitely an increase in GBV, but it's not the only factor. Um, but what we've also seen is that there's lots of home brews, um, alcohol are being uh, distilled at home. So although there's a ban, there's still consumption and there's still um, a domestic violence at home as a consequence of that consumption. But the, the question of GBV is wider than just alcohol. It's the patriarchal nature. It's also the, the question of mas masculinity. And the fact that men or there's less income and less provision at home, that was also, or that is also the contributing factor. Um, the dependence or the link between um, uh, the, um, what was that, um, dependence and GBV. Um, employment opportunities in rural commercial areas are limited. Um, and as I said, most of the work for women are only seasonal. Which and also the tenure security. You can only live on a farm if you work on a farm, and tenure contracts are given to males. So if a woman decide or should decide to separate from a man, she would she wouldn't have an independent income. She wouldn't have an independent um, accommodation. So that that's a link. So they remain in abusive relationships because of that. Um, the nature of the employment and also the nature of the um, tenure arrangement in commercial farming areas. Mm -hmm. Can I speak to one of the questions from Rino? Professor Swart? Sorry, I was unmuted. I was still muted, apologies. Rini, go ahead. I want to speak to one of the questions, I think from Robert. Yes. Um, maybe just to explain the process, I think the government and the municipalities are slowly becoming aware of the importance of the waste pickers. Three yeah. years ago, the government um, funded a project um, and it was actually funded by the CSIR by the roadmap. They, uh, Dr. Melanie Sampson from BITS was the facilitator of this project of writing guidelines for the integration of the waste reclaimers. So that the guidelines are were developed with everybody that can more or less were interested were part of that process. The reclaimers were part of the process as well. And um, that guidelines was now, I think, signed something like in last week or the week before. So um, that process now will start, I think from government side, there are some commitment to this. We will see if they will really do it. So the municipalities need to start looking at supporting the waste reclaimers um, and the training will start. So that process is ongoing. We will see where it will go to. Uh, Carmen, do you want to take the opportunity to speak to that same uh, question from Robert around the the other forms of legislation to formalize the situation of seasonal and informal workers? Well, 
We, we definitely, one of the big challenges with seasonal work is also the labor brokers. And labor brokers in the agricultural sector is often unregistered labor brokers, and uh, which inevitably uh, lead to unregistered uh, uh, workers. So one of is, uh, yeah, as an interim measure, it's also to, to ensure that workers in, in are properly registered and work and uh, work for identifiable employer. But what we would like to see seasonal work, agricultural work is not a lasting solution. So what we would really like to see is that seasonal women workers have independent access to their own land. So if that process of land reform can be formalized, we believe that the food security and the tenant security um, challenges that seasonal workers experience will be dealt with in a different form. Um, also to develop other kinds of industry um, within um, uh, rural areas, because to be, be dependent on agricultural work only is not the solution. So it's not necessarily only formalizing seasonal work, but looking at alternatives to seasonal work. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I just make a comment here that we shouldn't, uh, I think in this in this sense with the integration of the reclaimers, it doesn't mean formalizing in the sense of employment, it means recognizing, accommoda accommodating, supporting, in that sense, they still stay self-employed. Mm -hmm. Because from my experience and, and working with some of the waste because with you, that was quite an important aspect for them. The fact that they were independent. Um, yes. They valued that. Yes. Eva and Belinda can probably speak to that as well. Yeah, I agree. Um, I have, um, I think it would probably be our last question with one minute to go. Um, from uh, Morgan, the question is, how do you think a basic income grant will help waste pickers and women farm workers withstand not only crises, but in their daily struggle? Uh, and how, if at all, could it change their lives and livelihoods? Rini and Carmen, both of you are welcome to speak to that question. I personally um, is, a, is a great supporter of the basic income grant because I think it gives a bit of a safety net. Then on top of that, the income. So if something like this happens, there is already something in place that can carry them through a crisis. Um, it will not take the crisis away. It may not make, the, make their lives much better, but at least you have something to fall on. So yes, I think it will make a difference, but it would be nice to hear from Eva what she's also saying about that. Eva, do you want to comment on that? Okay, uh, uh, I think a, a grant will be good, but only if it allows everybody, not like separating the workers, like reclaimers, because it will be assisting on what already they have on the hand, because they are already working, so it will be assisting. So it will be good, because even if when the prices are so low the way they are now, that grant can help to maintain, to patch where the, 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 the prices have degraded. So I think it's a good one. Yeah, because the prices drop and then the income fall. Yes. Rina, can I just add something here before I forget? And I think Belinda, um, sorry, Carmen, I don't want to steal your time. But I think a critical point was around this issue was also the foreigners. I think I would like yeah. Belinda maybe to assist us with, because what we have found is the government did come in with some support, but it was only for South Africans. Yeah. So it yeah. left the the it left the foreigners in a massive crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you do yeah. have quite a, a high number proportion of yes. the waste pickers being or reclaimers being yes. um, foreign nationals. Yeah, yes. massive, massive. Okay, Carmen, do you want to respond to the question on the basic income grant? In which ways that will 
assist um, female or women on farms? Yeah, it will definitely ensure that there is an, a, some form of income throughout the year, especially for seasonal farm workers who don't have employment um, during parts of the year and who, who must wait some time before they receive any um, unemployment benefit. So it will help in that regard. We've also seen uh, during this time women who benefited from the 350 rand grant, who they use, how they use some of that grant um, to start a small, very small business selling basic stuff um, and making a small little profit. So a basic income grant will ensure that there is income to buy basic necessities, but also to create alternative, uh, alternative income. So, yeah. Thank you very much. I haven't seen more questions. This is quite an interesting topic and I think um, many discussions can still be, be had around that. But for now, um, thank you very much everybody for engaging and for, for your uh, presentations and also for the questions submitted by, by our participants. Uh, we leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you and bye. Go well, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Bye.